Thank you for that introduction. I'm so honoured. Um, I'm going to turn to the first slide there. Thank you. And uh, before I begin the keynote this morning, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Wadi Wadi people of the Durrawal land on which we meet virtually and pay my respects to elders past and present. I next wish to thank the organisers for their very warm invitation to the 20th IFIP conference being held in Ireland. We wish we were all there, the whole family. Thank you especially to Dennis Dennehy and Anastasia Griva for putting on this spectacular event. The program is so absolutely impressive. And to all of you who submitted papers and reviewed for the conference, I'm speaking today humbly to this IS community that contains some of the world's top theorists in the fields of information systems design and development. And I feel very, very humbled to be here. Today, I will be presenting on algorithmic bias, the Australian government's online compliance intervention system and its fallout. The OCI was dubbed RoboDebt. The presentation is divided into three parts. First, I'll review some theory, some literature, some methodology dating back some time. Then I'll dive into the RoboDebt case study as a framing, and then I'll provide an analysis and discussion. I hope today to deliver a presentation that you will never forget. That's the hope of every keynote, really. But this is particularly a chilling case study in so many different facets. And while as academics we have been taught that theory development is everything, and it is because of its widespread application, I want to challenge you to put on the theme of the conference today for the next two and a half days. Put it on your head snugly like you wear a hat, like you wear a beanie in winter. Stay on and support your colleagues for as many talks as your time zone and work commitments allow and listen to each other and learn. There's nothing like giving a virtual talk to three or four people. Stay on and enthuse each other, inspire each other, please. It's really, really important. So to this unique conference theme, responsible AI and analytics for an ethical and inclusive digitized society. The key terms here are responsible innovation with respect to AI and analytics, it's ethics and inclusion, and we can add in there justice and diversity, and the term digitized society. But I have deliberately focused my keynote on a case study that demonstrates all of the opposite to the conference theme. It's irresponsible innovation, it's unethical practice and exclusion of marginalized communities, it's injustice, not justice, and it's really going towards a fully automated system without human intervention. That is not just being a digitized society, but just being digitized and to an extent dehumanized. This can only lead to dire unintended consequences, and might I add consequences that were likely anticipated but never acknowledged by those in power. I mean the government agency in charge. Friends, this conference is a call to action. Please take it extremely seriously with respect to your work. We have the opportunity to carve out the next 10 years and say to ourselves, what are we going to do with our research and why does it matter? Is it going to be information systems for pandemics and social securitization? IS for what? For good? You might say, but aren't we already doing that? Aren't we trying to be introducing IS as an enabler for good? But what about this thing called AI, biometrics, IoT, CCTV cameras, surveillance, machine learning, convergence? I'm going to guess that the next 10 years of scholarship is not going to be focused on organisations per se, but on the interplay of these and other entities within the context of open systems. Think back to TRIST. He talked about the macro social. He talked about systems bigger than organizations. He wasn't talking about a singular department, but that's often what we've studied traditionally. It's also going to be about the complexity of the technology itself. Call it whatever you want, this new wave of AI, everything. Systems are becoming more and more entangled into the social fabric of everyday life. Everything is indeed open. 
And not is it only open, but in this new phenomenon, we also see the importance of various stakeholders. This quintuple helix that was based on the work of Eskowitz and Leidersdorf, which has gone through multiple iterations over time, has finally been adapted by Karajanas, Bath and Campbell into these five. I will say we will see even more divisions than the quintuple helix because this is how complex our global challenges are. In this case, he and his team talk about the way to face and address global warming as a driver for innovation. I love this research. It's meaningful research. There's a point to it, and it's not about selling more shiny gadgetry. It's looking at a problem through an ecosystem's view, and it's considering different stakeholders together and recognising that each has a part to play building for a sustainable future. All entities are important, whether they are government entities, third-party sector entities, business, media, academia, the natural environment itself that has almost become alive in some jurisdictions. Rivers now are like human entities. They're given the same rights. And alongside these natural places, society that settles on this earth. Now, I go back to this wonderful diagram by Gills in 2004. And on the one hand, you can talk about uh, pr the production side and on the other, the application domain. Here, Gills describes the basic elements and resources of socio-technical systems, identifying that there are two sides and in between these two sides, there's an interplay. The production side being that which are the systems of innovation that create and produce the technology artifact or process, and the application side being where the technology actually comes to play with a given use value in everyday work and life. These two systems come together, the production side meets the application side, and if you wish, a short uh, decision is to carry on with the tango. That's the interplay. Increasingly, however, we are beckoning one another for the domains to be in consultation to be inclusive, to be participatory for the production side to allow the users to participate in decision-making when the artefacts being produced are ultimately for them. We are talking here about the two sides to be in intercommunication with one another and not one being the more powerful and the other being absolutely powerless, almost enslaved to the adoption of one upgrade to another through planned obsolescence. The latest sentiment is not to produce anything for anyone, but to do that with them and to empower them and the community within which they exist. Time will tell if this is purely an idealist position or one that will in fact be embraced by the real world before too long. If I want to build something, I build it with you. I talk to you. You are not at arm's length. I am not remote. I empower your community. And this is not far off what was noted by Bernard Stahl's commemorative piece in JAIS in 2007, who took it upon himself to offer a beautiful critique of Enid Mumford's socio-technical approach. He writes, Enid Mumford was aware that the participative approach is not just a management tool, but has normative implications. The reason why ethics, this is Mumford's design approach, is ethical includes the inclusion of all stakeholders in the design process. Remember, not just the users. And the ability of users to exert influence over their future roles, like designers, and the sense of ownership. I'm building for me, my community, my generation, my future. And it offers users some level of control. It's not about saying, oh, they are the engineers over there or they are the STEM people or they are not. They are the anthropologists, social scientists and beyond. It is not just about the users, but all the stakeholders in the ecosystem who come together, direct and indirect stakeholders to listen and to deliberate and to act toward design, in essence, co-creating together. This diagram belongs to the Creative Reaction Lab that seeks equity-centered community design. It's all about healing. Healing, designers are worried about healing, healing a community, 
that's been wronged? I want you to hold this thought throughout the whole presentation to come. We've just begun to sow the seed of IS design through a socio-technical approach within an open system, ecosystem view. When we speak of co-design, that is exactly what we are talking about, the empowerment of the community by the design efforts. According to Taxi, the co in co-design stands for community or conversation. That's right. I'm talking to you. You're personable to me. I want to listen to you. It's about bringing together people and professionals to jointly make decisions informed by each other's expertise. It's not a community-only activity or a professional-only activity. It's the lived experience with professional expertise. It's about respect and greatly acknowledging the other's knowledge. It's the merging of these two fields and lived experiences and expertise. This diagram comes from hashtag End Homelessness Western Australia and is a co-design toolkit that I'm incorporating into my Smart Cities Infrastructure and Technology class at Arizona State University, considering the plight of those living with cognitive impairment and the potential for IS to be used for good. I'm taking what the Western Australian government used for homelessness and I'm using it for those living with dementia, autism, and living with mental health conditions. You can find out more at www.codesignthefuture.com. Now, before we venture too deeply into specific types of by design approaches, let's step back a moment into one of the defining papers speaking of failures in the context of management information systems and the socio-technical perspective. This figure, which we've all seen somewhere probably in our undergraduate careers, presented to us by Bostrom and Heinen, is an MISQ paper from 1977. And it provides for us an insular view focused on a department or corporation at large before the rise of the desktop computer and the internet and more. It also made an assumption that people would be part of every work system. Perhaps that term could be replaced by machines, as we'll see in a moment. And Bostrom and Heinen followed up this paper with a part two dedicated to a case study. And I stress here the role of the case study in much of this literature about success and failure of large scale information systems. So they looked at a circulation department about newspapers. And at the time, we can say there was transaction processing, things could still be dealt with in silos. But as Rob Kling and Sawyer later emphasized, the silos would need to be broken down. Bannister also mentioned this in a more uh, recent article. Thus, the emergence of the first materials resource planning. Then we had the manufacturing resource planning, Mark 1 and Mark 2, and then enterprise resource planning, Mark 1. Of course, the business process re-engineering. I was very fortunate to be part of Otis Elevator Company with MRP2 and also part of the SAP R3 implementation of the Campo Altex Caltex merger uh, through Anderson Consulting. And now this ERP2, some people dub it enterprise architecture integration, some people dub it IoT, uh, whatever it is, it's all about systems integration efforts to break down those walls. And now, of course, with machine learning revolution, the AI and analytics continues to change the game. But what do we know about these big information systems? They are highly prone to what? to failure. And not only because they are big, failure seems particularly prevalent in large-scale information systems for public administration. They are clunky. They blow out of budget. They are difficult to control. They're poorly project managed. There is high staff turnover in public agencies. They suffer from function creep and generally just don't work properly. The question is whether AI further exacerbates a known problem and what we might be able to do to mitigate against that. Even if we don't exactly know how the machine learning algorithms will behave with the training data available. We can, of course, gather business analytics to help us project manage better the rollout of the future mode of operation of a public sector information system. As we've noted in a recent call for ITMP with Dennis, Elias and so many others, 
But how might we go about harnessing the power of analytics when the problems are so many that at times they seem insurmountable, especially in government agencies? And so I'll point here to literature on the topic of large-scale public information systems failures and successes. A seminal paper here by Yoga Stulvedi and eight other authors, among them Deborah Bunker from Australia and Mike Myers from New Zealand, who tackle this amazing question. And surprise, surprise, when they're referring to either the successes or the failures, we start to see that Boschram and Hainan model or framework, theoretical framework, uh, start to come to the fore. Here we see uh, Peter et al. from 2013 breaking down things into tasks, structures, people, and technology. Of course, this is reminiscent of that 1977 MISQ paper. And even the failures follow a similar but more distinct pattern identifying some wonderful contributions by these authors, and it's worth spending a moment to point this out. Please go through these. These are the beginnings of identifying from this paper in 2015 with over 500 sites from memory. Uh, what are those things that are the success uh, indicators or failures uh, for large-scale systems? And then we can go to Goldfinch, a great paper here on pessimism, computer failure, and information systems development in the public sector. Again. Uh, he points to other work produced uh, here by Heeks and again follows this notion of people, process, tasks, etc. And so we start to see a, a, a really a repetitious view of the reliance on that Boschram and Hainan article and the importance of socio-technical theory and design. And here are just some more. Barry Bozeman, who's now at Arizona State University, one of the seminal works on public management information systems, also talks about failures success and failures of computerized information systems, information systems in developing countries, failure, success, and local improvisation, breaking down the silos by Bannister in public and administration, and that's what we keep saying. We're going to break down those silos. And I point here very subtly to a term that you may wish to synonymize in the future, at least with information systems, and that is either interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity Think about at the very root of an organisation. And so another landmark paper here, which we see uh, this juncture in the literature, again by Enid Mumford in 2006, on successes and failures and potential regarding socio-technical design. Why this linkage with success, failure, design and theory of socio-technical? It is Enid who very strongly begins to talk on values so systematically Look at her book, Values, Technology and Work from 1981. And though we have values introduced much earlier, it was Enid who really struck it tough and hard on us way before uh, the current authors are talking about values. But we can't take away from these wonderful contributions like Batya Friedman and her team on value-sensitive design. And on the right there, we start to see these values being articulated, trust, Privacy, calm, values like calm. And no surprise at all that Batya and her team have uh, gone back some time, and I would say gone back to the 50s, where we look at Norbert Wiener's work, The Human Use of Human Beings, and we start to see the emergence of people thinking about user-centred design beyond participatory design human-centred design, co-design, engineering by design, ethical alignment by design, value-sensitive design, values-based design, privacy and security by design, democracy by design, by design, by design, these values, which are the most important to the system that you're building. And yes, while value-sensitive has been considered a narrow area, with some criticism, uh, Henry, and forgive me for misspelling his surname, David I met in 2019 in Phoenix, uh, have been revising and trying to uh, tie what seemingly was originally this lack of moral commitment to the actual values. And some have come out, like Shannon Vallow, and said, well, is it really about values or virtue ethics? And then we've had others like Sarah Speakerman talking about values-based design. Then Stephen Umbrello, of course, on his AI for social good, talking about this full life cycle monitoring 
is which is necessary to encourage redesign if things go wrong with the AI and we pick up on it. And this would have been extremely important had we instituted this with the crisis that unfolded with RoboDebt, the scandal in Australia. We had early warning signs, but nobody did a thing. Then, of course, the wonderful work uh, of uh, Van Wiensberg, forgive me. Um, I'm going to remember Amy, of course, whom I've co-edited a special issue on robotics, Amy Van Winsberg. And she comes out with these values, looking at care robots and care-centred. So she takes the care and makes it a by-design feature. And she talks about data privacy, accessibility, responsibility, and the list goes on and on. But these are the first signs that we start to see this right angle turn sharply about how we're going to introduce different kinds of value-based systems to advance more complex technologies like robotics, AI, and analytics. We also had a special issue with Alan Winfield. Please check it out. The design and governance of ethical AI and autonomous systems. There was also this one uh, by the team. Uh, and I'll go straight to the next slide. So as we come to the end of the first section, public interest technology starts to raise its head. We talked about global warming there for a moment. We talked about the publics and the large scale. But think about public information systems, not just public interest tech, public information systems. And you might say to me, we already have those. But what if I threw in the word open? This is a new paradigm of technology for the public interest that is public interest tech through perhaps open and public information systems, as I said, for sustainable futures. This new paradigm is not about getting rich quick, but about care. This is not about moving fast and breaking things or disruptive innovations. I'm going to say it's about being cognizant of our environment and the people who inhabit this planet and most immediately our neighbour who is near us. And I want to move to this wonderful uh, depiction here by uh, Robert Abbas et al, showing the building blocks. I think this is the closest that we've started to get to, to operationalizing these values beyond even that work of Nissenbaum and co. What we start to see is a fluidity in a process that is very much steeped in socio-technical theory and allows us to partake of different types of by design at any one of these processes. It also points to the public interest. And for the first time, we see an amalgamation between the information systems development and design, the HCI, the innovation realm, technology, and then the public interest, all in the one slide, all with those values there are on the rims. So our innovations should be purpose-driven and not to flog off yet another minimum viable product that will yield for us the biggest return on investment with the biggest externalities. That's not what IS is about, folks. This goes as much for government agencies serving civil society as it does businesses serving a consumer market. Already we are seeing language being redefined. People are people. They make up society. Relegating them to consumers or customers means they are something other than human. That is why there is a new wave of business meeting HCI towards user-centred, as I said, people-centred, even humane design. Here I'm going to claim something that every innovation scholar knows. A product is a process, and we really need to dig deep and think about our processes of coordination at every level of our society, and as the literature points to time and time again, breaking down these silos. Friends, I want to stress to you something. I am personally a bit tired of hearing about the digital transformation mantra and how it will make everything better. Some weeks ago, I was invited to speak at the launch of the Central Africa chapter of the Association for Information Systems, and I focused my attention not only for IS as an enabler, but specifically towards social transformation. Social. We need to begin with social transformation through social development. The good inner life does not come from the material, but usually that which is invisible and cannot be touched. Let's refocus our attention on critical infrastructure, reducing potential exposures, care, care, care networks, care chains. These fundamental services are eroding in some places in the world. Even in the West, you would be shocked. It does not mean that the machines cannot help us. 
I'm not advocating for a technocratic rule, nor am I advocating that we put away our smartphones and our nodes. I'm a technologist, but something is missing in our community. And when I share with people what that is, they usually tell me is people are lacking empathy or they're not being authentic in the workplace or not acting responsibly when they should be or not always thinking of possible alternative ways, ways, just a quick way to get it over and done with. Let me get myself out of the situation so I don't have to be accountable. We will not really progress as a society unless this happens. Even if our tools might, technically speaking, progress, if we don't socially transform, we can have all the analytics to tell us this, you're not transforming. The machine would only be telling us what we already know. Augmented or artificial anything is not going to make us a better society that has a better chance of survival as a species. And here, again, back to Mumford, from one of her last works before she passed. Enid here is talking about something bigger than business, something even bigger than government. She termed it the global economy in this paper. Ladies and gentlemen and others, we can have all the technology in the world, but if there is no justice, no tranquility where we live, and if there is limited welfare and limited freedom to be ourselves, then what do we have? This question is chilling. Today, if you dare to ask it, it's easier just to answer the next email. But we have to ask the hard questions. What is all this for? Isn't what we are seeking one and the same, all of us, whether black or white, rich or poor, developing nation, newly industrialised nation, global south, global north, whatever you want to call it, citizen or alien, don't we all just want to close our eyes at night ensure our family and friends have enough provisions and burst out of bed to a rising sun in the morning? Isn't that what we all want? So how can IS help us? How can it help us get there? To reflect briefly on what we've spoken about so far, we've talked about responsible innovation, ethics and inclusion. We've described the importance of open systems and ecosystems. We've identified the difference between the production side and the application side of an innovation process. We looked at socio-technical systems in the context of organisations. We pointed, pointed to IS failures. We know they exist, and we know they exist specifically in large-scale public information systems. But we also pointed to the public interest and this loggerheads between digital transformation, this race to get ahead technologically, but also of social transformation and social development. We spoke about the concept of care, of values, of different types of by-design approaches, and we question the definition of what is progress, just like the ancients. Before I continue, just one more acknowledgement. I really believe in recognising the efforts of collaborators. I don't do the quality or volume of work that I do alone. And in line with emergent credit guidelines, I identify the roles of the research team who will look into this presentation even deeper as we go about embarking on the writing of a paper together. I'm very excited about that journey. Next to each person, I have the primary role, but by no means are we a group that segments bits and pieces without contributing to the whole. Robert Abbas on socio-technical theory and design, Sharia Akhtar on algorithmic bias, Roger Clark, very well known in the Australian context, particularly for public sector IS failures, particularly in government. Robert, the case study will be my baby, and Jeremy Pitt for pitching with intelligent systems. Friends in the IS community, you can take a pebble and throw it in a lake by yourself and it will make a little ripple for a moment. You can take the heaviest rock and throw it and it will make a bigger splash and a few more ripples, but the water will soon subside again. What will it profit us to slave on articles in the middle of the night without a collective aim? and for that matter, all alone. Choose teams that are strategic. Work with people you like. Mobilise our IS community. Bring diverse members in. Bring transdisciplinarity and openness in. Apply it to something. If we do not believe that our research has reflexive or practical value, that someone can take it and put it into practice and something beneficial will come from it, then we are doing nothing more than paper shuffling and make, maybe making our H index bigger. I also want to point the sustained effort, building a team that you can stick with over a long time, and this community is an example of it, that you love and respect, 
and believe in it. One of the most fulfilling relationships will come out of these things in a researcher's life. And more than that, the more you research together, the greater the real and actual impact on society. How can you prove you're making an impact? And nothing I've presented today except the flaws you might find uh, in my guided tour are mine. So my flaws, not my, my fellow team members. So as we go to RoboDebs, and I know we have about 13 minutes left before question time, but let's make this fast and furious. I've deliberately chosen to speak on the infamous RoboDebt, otherwise known as the Online Compliance Intervention System. RoboDebt was supposed to help the Australian government better identify overpayments in Social Security to welfare recipients in order to save on the unnecessary expenditure. In short, it was supposed to catch people who were making fraudulent claims, either accidentally or deliberately. The system focused on introducing artificial intelligence techniques going beyond semi-automated data matching capabilities that were cross-checked by humans to achieve better operational effectiveness. Unfortunately, what was to be one of the government's greatest demonstrations of digital transformation within, actually became uh, one of its most dismal failures. A horrible story. From the moment it was rolled out, the OCI system began to automatically send debt collection notices to already vulnerable and innocent Australian citizens, demanding immediate repayment. Look at the language on the screen. In some cases, totaling tens of thousands of dollars, you owe the government $20,000. Pay up immediately. It's estimated, and this figure seems impossible, but it's not, 433,000 debt letters amounting to 1.73 billion in repayments were wrongly sent out to Australians. How many Australians are there, folks? 26 million? Almost half a million debt letters were sent out. The aftermath of the robo-debt scandal has played out in the courts. And guess what? The Australian government lost 1.8 billion for those it wrongly pursued. So Centrelink within Services Australia exists to service its most vulnerable population in Australia through electronic payments and welfare recipients. These welfare payments could be to retirees, the unemployed, carers, people with disabilities, the Indigenous, and the list is long. And the present mode of operation uh, under the auspices of the Human Services Act from 1997 allowed for customers, citizens, to engage with e-payments under this regulation of the Human Services Act, and people who did this falsely actually were identified with false claims. The government used to identify some 20,000 per year, and they used data matching with human intervention to cross-check whether some of the successful matches on fraud or accidental error were occurring. So there were people in the system. There were human workers in the middle. In the future mode of operation, by 2016, the new fully automated system uh, was generating debt notices automatically. There was no oversight. It was the AI at the centre of this socio-technical system that was sending out demands. And in fact, the government deemed later, sorry, the courts deemed later they were vague. They weren't just sending out debt notices. There was not even a reason stipulated about why so the individual receiving the debt notice was thinking what was going on, where was the error, they didn't even know where to begin. And so what we had by 2017, four months into the scheme, was 169,000 debt notices sent and 300 million were recovered, an average uh, fee or debt notice of $1,800 per person receiving this. Friends, at the time, I was performing uh, some duties for the Australian School of Government. Weeks into the implementation, when already citizens had begun to say there was a problem with the system. But by then only 12,000 people had had a knock on the door, pay up. They didn't stop, even though I warned them as a member, as a board member of the Australian Privacy Foundation. I find that unbelievable. But it continued for some time and it impacted more and more people. And the criticisms 
that people have really targeted at this OCI, this RoboDebt, was that visibility about who actually designed the system, even till today, who rolled out the system is still lacking. Quite strangely, the services of the Digital Transformation Agency were not called upon. The DTA, the DTA has more than 200 employees in the Australian government with a budget of 125 million. Their job is services design. They go through a four-stage process, discovery, research, alpha, testing hypotheses and building prototypes, beta, trialing the prototypes and going live, making platforms available and continually improving. They had nothing to do with RoboDebt, and the question was why. So a targeted and already vulnerable population, the mailing of debt notices just kept going, and it was very much deemed poor practice, and this was supposed to be an intelligent system, right? Artificial intelligence for good. The online compliance intervention system did not target those who are on a stable salary, but those who were desperate for social security payments. So the minute you got a debt notice, your money stopped coming in fortnightly. You couldn't pay for your energy bills. You couldn't pay for your rent. Do you see how dire this is? People with disability, single parents, those with really embedded issues that needed support. And we identified uh, with Sharia Akhtar three types of biases here, which we published most recently in an IGIM paper model bias, data bias, and social or societal bias. I'm going to skip in the consciousness of time uh, through to uh, looking at what the AI errors actually meant. And in a nutshell, what happened was when people were asked to present information about their prospective salaries, being on part-time salaries, they would put in an estimate. And if their estimate was wrong, they were deemed to have been partaking in fraud. Or, for example, if they overestimated and then tried to claim monies that was uh, to be given to them, they were told that they were overpayments. In other times, uh, they were basically told, well, you haven't entered any information these last two weeks about your work pattern. We're going to look at your historical work patterns from our training database and tell you what you should be paying. And this is an unbelievable act to those who are on casual work, not on salaries. And so RoboDebt was supposed to be a public good to catch those making fraudulent claims, costing other taxpayers money. But instead, this public good caused personal harm. Technology errors have a human toll. Technology is not neutral, and the humans behind the technology need to be held accountable. There was unintended consequences from RoboDebt, financial hardship, anxiety and distress, suicidal ideation, and would you believe, in some cases, suicide. One person received a debt notice on Australia Day over $22,000. He was a 28-year-old who took his own life as a result, of course, living with comorbid conditions, but it must have just pushed him over the edge, a parent giving evidence in court. In fact, over the lifetime of this robo-debt scandal, it is estimated some 622 people died from which causes we are not so sure holistically, but that was an ABC report on Triple J. Many say that they felt shame and hurt, they were wrongly branded welfare cheats, and if we look at the number, 1.7% of people over the age, right, of 16 were impacted. That's almost two in 100 people if you count it like that. And the heaviest toll was felt by the unemployed, the disabled, those who couldn't afford grocery bills, at risk of losing their shelter. That's what's most heinous about this. And the other thing was, why did this happen in the first place? The system was working in a semi-automated fashion. 20,000 debt notices were being sent out per annum, not 20,000 each week. And so we go back to work by Goldfinch that looks at these public administration IS failures en masse. And he talks about something called idolization. The public servants idolizing IT and seeing it as the, the hope of freedom, the ability to actually rectify all wrongs. But we don't have enough evidence that there were wrongs to begin with. Of course, there were some slipping through the cracks. But why did we go to a future mode of operation? What was the impetus or motivation? There was no consultation. The vulnerable communities in Australia those who rely 
on the welfare payments were not consulted. Additional stakeholders in the ecosystem were not consulted back to Mumford, back to Bostrom and Heenan. Commonwealth ombudsmen demanded greater visibility, greater transparency, but the vulnerable Australians kept rolling. We call this algorithmic fallout. This is unjust. This is unfair rulings. This is an increase in societal burden. This is distrust in the effectiveness and operationalization of AI-based systems in welfare. This is asymmetric attacks on one's character, 433,000 people's character. This is hurt and anguish, and even ultimately it was death. No wonder Sophia Noble calls these algorithms of oppression linked to people's livelihoods. Where is the managerial capability of real accountability? Monolithic government agency systems with broad reach require commensurate socio-technical design, detailed piloting, rigorous testing, external risk assessment and evaluation. There was no risk assessment. What was the point of being fast to the table? The case study demonstrates the human cost. If there is a story to tell with robo-debt, it's failure. It's failure at a mega scale. It's AI's ethics disaster. When we consider human rights abuses as a result of poorly designed technology systems, we are entering into a new realm of inquiry. Yes, we can build systems without a human in the loop to process things that previously were managed by humans, but is there any human in the loop anywhere? When the head of Services Australia was asked, well, what about the OCI? What about the scandal? What about RoboDebt? She says, RoboDebt, what's that? Quote, unquote. This is time to bring the human back into the loop, friends. Human training is essential for building a workforce that can identify, intervene, and interrupt flawed flows. We must go forward with AI and multi-agent systems, but we need to train people to identify when it's time to stop, when it's time to better train data sets, when it's time to actually do the testing appropriately, when it's time to talk to the vulnerable people who it will affect. And perhaps this new AI paradigm is shifting us away from any kind of service. We used to think we used to get full service. Someone was on the other side answering our questions. Then we moved to this 2000s model of self-service. But in fact, friends, I think we're out of service and I think we're out of order here. And some might say, totally out of order. This is a call for major reform and a warning to future large-scale public administration AI-based systems of the unintended consequences on humans. We may wish to remove humans from the loop, but we need to be cognizant in doing so. We do not let the machines that have been organised by the humans tread on the values of care, of accountability and safety. And humans, finally, are not machines. Thank you very much for your attention.